good afternoon. This is your host, Guillermo Salvatier, the Director of International Services at HSI, and I am your host today for Perspectives on Energy. Uh, and welcome. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, basically power systems for the rest of us. It is a, uh, a second in the series of, of almost of a an intro on power system fundamentals, right? And welcome to the show. And uh, I know we had a, a, the part one a couple of weeks ago. This would be a part two. So thank you once again. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll jump right in. So hopefully this, uh, the whole purpose of these series of um, uh, th this one and the last uh, part one really is to get personnel or, or viewers that are not in the actual uh, energy industry or in the, in the electric utility industry more familiar with how these um, systems operate, uh, specifically to get them a better, a better grasp on how this all works and to give them an understanding of how um, the language, the vernacular, the fundamentals in a power system or the grid or how the electric utility work, how systems work, so they can get, uh, get be better prepared to whether they're engaging in conversations, dialogue, even policy making or legislation. So hopefully this is helpful on that. There's, again, this is just a very small slice of all the content and knowledge areas. But hopefully this gets, gets people in the right direction and it gives them an idea of how these systems work. Okay, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, I believe uh, video may have had this earlier on in, in the previous week, but this is an example of how a system generally works, right? You have a, a generation station over there in, on the left uh, in black. Uh, that had, Then you have a step of transformer. You have in blue is your transmission system, which is the lines that everybody complains about, all the high voltage power lines, typical NIMBY problems that we encounter, not in my backyard. And, and those are the things that are very large, unsightly. They take up a lot of space and a lot of real estate. But you need them. They're a vital part of the grid. You need those to be able to move power from a lot, not just one, but several power plants, interconnected power plants over to where the load is at. And the load is usually everything on the right, all those different uh, customers, whether they're, they're the residential customers, in, industrial, commercial, and things along the sort. Now, mind you, everything in blue is usually stepped up to high voltage. So in black, we start with the generators, and they usually start at a lower voltage uh, because of the fact the way it's designed. It's easier to design these systems such that they generate power at a low voltage, and they step it up. And then the reason I step it up is because it's easier to transport power across some um, vast distances. And you also don't need to build infrastructure so thick. In other words, you're moving a lot of electrons w without the need to make the conductor so thick. So it's economies of scale and also makes it a lot more economic. Also, the fact that it's easier to, to manage high voltages than it is to manage high current. Remember, current, um, the, the equation power is equal to voltage times current. So higher the voltage, the lower the current gets to be, and you get the same amount of power. In a nutshell, I mean, AC circuits have a little bit of differences too compared to DC circuits, but that's basically inherently the basic concept. Um, there's different levels, well, 138 kilovolts, 1,000 volts, 130,000 volts, 340, all the way up to 765,000 volts, a very high voltage transmission lines. And that, of course, is moved across vast distances. And then it's at some point when you get to the green portion, you get to stations where they step it down. And the reason they step that voltage down is so they can move that into, into the different areas, more like your neighborhoods, right? All the power lines you find that are not that tall, they're sitting either in, in your backyard and in your streets. And before they go on the ground to feed your residential customers, which is your house, your apartment buildings, uh, your commercial places, your malls, airports, whatever, whatever it is, eventually everybody served from a distribution circuit. And that's why it's written. It's uh, painted in green in this diagram. Now, mind you, this is one, this is a single two-dimensional cross-section of the grid. In reality, this is many dimensions deep, right? Because it is a grid and uh, there's many power plants attached to, the, to many different layers of that blue stuff, right? Of that blue uh, transmission grid. Now, from, at many different points from that blue transmission grid, you have many points where you have those uh, substation step down transformers where you're stepping down from transmission voltage down to distribution voltage. 
And that's usually anywhere you have the load center, right? And that's for that. So with that in mind, let's make sure we understand, right, that, that um, this is a very vast, big system, and it's all interconnected, right? Now, in places like Hawaii, right, you're going to have islands, literal islands, but then you also have a lot of electrical islands, where each island by itself is its own system with its own, little, uh, its own set of generators, its own set of load, and they're not interconnected, you know, like they are, for example, in the mainland, where uh, a power station in Florida is electrically connected all the way to uh, through the grid to a power station all the way in like Maine or New York. And all that offers support, whereas in, in a smaller island like, like in Hawaii and any one of the different islands, they're more uh, subject and vulnerable to disturbances, and which is brings us when we'll show that in the next few slides coming up. Next slide, please. So uh, talked about that a little bit. Now we have, of course, the operations. We also have a regulatory environment, and we just we touched on that briefly the last time, but really it's broken down into generation, transmission, and distribution. And in between those, you have transformers, where they either step the voltage up, and they step it down. And that is, in a nutshell, how the power grid is, is basically segmented or divided. Now, on the distribution side, you're going to, see, you're going to be seeing more and more of the uh, distributed energy resources, which is solar and batteries and everything ha happening behind the meter for a lot of the customers, right? Residential, commercial, and industrial. And that will be a new, a new age in, in our industry. And, but it's, it's still developing, and I'm curious to see what will happen. Right? Next slide, please. So, uh, and that's, that's illustrated here, right? Where we're seeing different, uh, different uh, inverters. You see in green in the slide. So everything with that circle uh, on, on the left, for example, those are all power plants, and it depicts a present configuration. You're going to see more and more of these inverter-based resources popping up everywhere, some large, some small, but a lot of them are contributing to the grid. Uh, as you see more of those, you're going to see an interesting change in the behavior of the grid as you have disturbances and then some reliability, which is why you have new standards on these inverter-based resources. But I think ultimately you're going to see some of those as well on the residential side, where customers behind the meters will be uh, producing power and sending power back to the grid through the distribution site into the transmission system. So it'll be a real different change, whereas power is going to flow back the other way in a way that it never has before. So it'll be a really interesting challenge, and it's exciting, and we'll see what the future holds. Here. Next slide, please, number five. All right, so generators, right? So as you can see, most generators are connected. At this here, we're only showing two of them across one bus. But in reality, there's like hundreds, if not thousands of generators across the entire system. Uh, most of them have the same angle, same frequency, and they're balanced. Problem is that when you have a generator that's unbalanced, or several generators unbalanced, the, the primary symptom of that, that sort of imbalance is usually manifested in the fact that the angles are changing between one and the next. They could be either operating at a slightly different frequency or they are worse oscillating back and forth where the angle changes. And what you see here basically is that you notice that the, the rotor angle between one and the other is slightly different. Well, that changes the way they produce power. And if these angles begin to oscillate back and forth, usually on a weird undamped oscillation, you could, you know, pretty much uh, work your way into a blackout if that isn't arrested. And there, there's systems in place to be able to control that, whether they're automatic voltage regulators or, more importantly, the power system stabilizers. But an unbalanced system usually can be brought about by a simple disturbance. Now, the more generators you have in the system spinning around the same speed and the same frequency, same angle, the more stable you are. As you begin to remove some of those and replace them with like inverter-based resources, this unbalanced situation it tends to happen a little bit more often. So something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So um, here on a system demand and generator loading is basically what we're looking at as far as uh, a typical day, in this case, uh, from like midnight all the way out to like uh, minute to midnight in two hour increments. And what it is is looking at, for example, your load curve in blue, your X your, your your generation capacity in green and how the, the, the different the horizontal bars, units one, two, three, and four, five, six, seven, they are basically units that are run at different times depending on what you need. So when you see unit one, for example, that thing runs pretty much all the time. So does unit two until midnight. And at midnight, that unit kind of basically either backs down or shuts off. Units three and four, they will either back off and shut down. And then units five, six, and seven, those are run as needed. 
So what's happening now, as you can imagine, you know, the, uh, units one and two are pretty much inexpensive to run once you're running, but they're very expensive to shut down and start up again. Uh, so at the further up you go in units three, four, five, and six, the more expensive they are to run, and but they're quicker to start, quicker to shut off. But the problem is, remember, it's everything has a startup and a shutdown cost. Mind you, one and two have a very expensive startup and shutdown cost, but their cost of running is really, really inexpensive relative to the other units. This is why they, they're kept running all the time. These are known as base load units. So if you are now forced to shut these down at maybe twice a day or something or back them down because you have a lot of excess generation renewables, then you are then incurring a cost, which is rather significant and measured in a number of ways, whether it's maintenance, fuel, emissions, and a, and a bunch of different problems, right? Also remember, as you're shutting these off, you're losing a lot of system inertia, and that's just cycling them off and on. And on top of that, some of these units have a limit to the number of times that they can sh start up and shut down in one day. So one thing to remember, like, th these units are usually run. Now, excess capacity is anything that's above that green line that's curving, and that, that is your load curve for the day, meaning behaviors uh, as we, for example, as a society, as an economy, as an infrastructure, we wake up. Usually four o'clock, some people are getting up. Six o'clock, everybody gets up. So six to 10, everybody's either driving to work. Then at 10, I guess that's when all the renewable resources come in. Sunlight, wind backs down. And then at around five, all that disappears. And then everybody goes home, turns on their, they call it the cooking peak. A little bit later, you have the lighting peak, which is the sun sets. And then you have all the lights turning on. And then everybody kind of stays up for like eight or nine. And then at 9 p.m., everybody just goes to bed. And that's where, you, where the load begins to drop off again. And then it repeats again the next day. And that's your typical load curve for the day. And it shows how your generators are staggered depending on what's needed for that time. Next uh, slide, please. Okay. So here we have an example of what a coal fired power plant looks like. And I know it's become the big villain in the, uh, in the climate, change, uh, climate change initiatives. And usually those are the ones they want to shut down. But you got to remember, right? The reason they burn the coal is just really to actually generate heat to heat up that boiler where you have water going through going through some, pipe, some pipes and the boiler tubes, they call them. And then eventually the, that water heats up, becomes superheated steam, goes through the steam line, spins a turbine off to the right. And that turbine is mechanically connected to the generator. As that turbine spins at a certain specific speed, that generator produces electricity. And then the electricity goes off to the, to the step of transformer and you have power. This is one example. Now, every most every power plants are the same from the boiler off to the right. They usually have some kind of heat source that's heating water to produce steam to spin to spin a uh, to spin a steam turbine to spin a generator, and that's how your water is produced. To the left of that, you know, the heat source that varies. That can be a that can be nuclear. That can be gas. That can be a different set of things. But this is your typical boiler fired <coughs> steam turbine. Generator and, in and power plant, in this case, it's just coal-fired. But usually these boilers, pretty much, you, ne you need a heat source to heat up that water to create steam. All right, let's go to the next slide. And this is a close-up some more of the you know, more simplified. This is a, now, of course, a combustion turbine. And here, what they've done is that they basically replaced all that steam. And what they do instead is actually treat this like a jet engine. So they're putting fuel into these turbines, and then they're compressing the air, igniting it, and then now it's spinning like a jet engine. Again, this is still connected to a generator to produce electricity, but the spinning of the turbine here is done with actual combustion, hence combustion turbine, and it operates like a jet engine, basically. So it takes in air, it's mixed, it's compressed, it's mixed in with fuel, it's ignited, spins this turbine along a shaft, and as it spins, then you have exhaust coming out the other end, which is hot, Keep that, keep that in mind. This is wasted heat for now. We'll recover that in a, in a different type of process. But this is a very simple cycle, they call it. And there's a combustion turbine. And these are really, really quick. They start them immediately whenever they need them. Uh, they're expensive in some cases, right? But then what they do is they run them as needed. They shut them off uh, when they don't need them anymore. And they're pretty handy to have around. And uh, these will run anywhere between 30 all the way to like 200, 260 megawatts. About right, depending on what they need. And usually, those are GE seven FAs. I think they they just make a lot of them this, uh, uh, in different sizes, but they're pretty much the same out there. And they dominate the industry quite a bit. Most of these are are gas fired, natural gas, 
and they're easily built, easily deployed, easy to run. Um, they do require some maintenance quite a bit, you know, with these uh, turbine blades. But that's your combustion turbine power plant, otherwise known as a simple cycle. Go to the next slide, please. So now we go, we go from simple cycle to combined cycle. And here we have like a very, the first stage is the same as your uh, simple cycle combustion turbine, except, you know, here you are capturing that heat, right? So this, this first stage is connected to a generator and it's running, but then the exhaust gases are captured. And remember the whole boiler thing that I showed you earlier was the same thing. That those exhaust gases are heating up all this like water in tubes in this boiler. Those boiler pipes create are capturing steam. The steam turns turns that a, tur a steam turbine, and that steam turbine then spins a generator to produce electricity from this heat that otherwise would have been wasted and vented into the atmosphere. So this is called a combined cycle power plant, and that whole second stage uh, where you have that boiler is called the HERSA. It's a heat recovery steam generator. So this is a very efficient system. Great to have, and, and there are a lot of them in the uh, there are a lot of them in the grid out uh, in, in the U.S. in the world. Take a little bit longer to build, but they're highly efficient. Uh, the problem with them is that cycling them off and on is a little bit more involved and it incurs quite a bit of a cost. And then for, and then they do cycle them off often, but not as often as a simple cycle CTs, right? And certainly not like a uh, these are, but they will cycle these before they cycle a base load unit. Okay, next uh, slide, please. Okay, now here we go with the nuclear power plant. Right? An example here basically is you're using a nuclear reaction to basically heat up water. And you're heating up water to the point that you create steam. That steam goes to the steam, the steam is in a steam generator, spins a steam turbine, steam turbine then spins a generator, and you got power. Same thing as before with the whole boiler system, right? But you're heating up water to spin a steam turbine. So again, what you've changed here is the heat source once again, right? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so there are different types. There's a pressurized water reactor, and this is pretty much most of the Western world has this, a much safer system, um, not your Chernobyl's. And in this case, you have a containment building, right? Which pretty, pretty much prevents a, uh, a meltdown, contains a, a uh, steam blast, whatever that is. And you have, for example, your reactor with the control rods, and that's where you have the nuclear material. And then there, the, you have a lot of heat generated and water is running through there. You see the pump down there, you have a water line and that water runs in and out of that steam, um, out of that uh, that reactor. And and the steam generator is basically what that is, the heat exchange, where you have a lot of these pipes are, are, are wound together, but the water is never coming in contact. The, the, the two different water circuits do not come in contact. They exchange heat, but they don't come in contact. So, so the steam line that goes outside that containment building is not radioactive, and which is important to keep in mind. Now, mind you, there is some losses here, considerable losses, and it's not as efficient and as, as the next uh, system I will demonstrate. But in this case, it's it's then from this point on, from the turbine onwards, the same as the other boiler system. Right, you just basically heating up steam to to spin a turbine that in turn spins a generator that finally produces power. So this is a pressurized water reactor. So keep that in mind. It has a pressurized uh, steam generator and that, that has a, uh, a heat exchanger to heat up the steam on the steam line on the other. Next uh, slide, please. Now here we have a boiling water reactor and this is somewhat like Chernobyl's, a lot more efficient, but the problem is that you are now getting radioactive water coming out to the steam turbine and back into the containment uh, area in the reactor core. So the issue here is that now the actual steam turbine is hot, hot meaning it's radioactive. So uh, again, there's no losses as much as the uh, the uh, pressurized water reactor, but this boiling water reactor you know, is a lot more efficient, but you also run the risk of having more exposure of those like uh, radioisotopes and particles and radiation outside of the system. So again, this is uh, a little closer to the Chernobyl design, and you don't see too many of these anymore. But the, 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 these two are the large scale nuclear reactors or nuclear power plant. In the US, the pressure water reactors are designed that pretty much dominated for decades, and it's safer, and uh, that's what we see the most. Okay, next slide, please. Hydroelectric here, there's no heat going on. All you're using is the pressure of the water flowing from the reservoir out to those like, uh, those water water turbines, they call them wicket gates, and uh, that turbine spins a generator, and I can show you that in the next slide. 
And the example here is you see the reservoir on the right with the dam. Now, mind you, that pressure down there is way higher than it is at the surface. So that pressure pretty much in there goes through these control flows, the wicket gates, and that spins that, that Kaplan turbine. That Kaplan turbine has a shaft that is connected to a generator. And that generator pretty much spins, creates electricity, and then that's stepped up with that voltage, with that uh, in voltage, with that transformer, and it goes off to the grid to fit to fit pretty much everything else. Mind you, this is a very clean, efficient, and has zero emissions and it's renewable. But building one of these is a really huge undertaking. It's a capital project, and it has a huge environmental impact. When you dam up a river and you pretty much flood a whole valley and create a giant lake or reservoir. But again, this is a very, uh, very clean water source and reliable. Uh, re next slide, please. And related to that, you have a pump storage plant, and it is it is the same design. It has it has a reservoir, it has a, an area to keep water, but then you also have uh, a. In most cases, you have this is like an open circuit type of uh, pump storage plant, but the nice ones have like for example two different reservoirs, one on the high level and one, one on the low level. And the way this works basically is that it moves water back and forth, right? So when you have the reservoir and, and the intake up there, off to the upper right-hand corner, that's like a regular hydroelectric dam. You open the gates, water flows out, you generate power, and then the, uh, the discharge is all collected in this, in this lower reservoir. When you have excess power in the system, then this, this uh, generator becomes a pump. It's reversible, and then this pump begins to like pull water out of that lower reservoir, and it pumps water up to the, to the high reservoir, and then you basically recharge your system, right? This is basically one of the oldest energy storage devices out there, and a lot of them are making a comeback. I know in places like West Virginia and some of the Carolinas, and some of the areas on the Blue Ridge Mountains, and in the and then even in some places up in the Azores, right? They're using these systems uh, to basically uh, supplement, you know, their grid in, in lieu of buying expensive batteries. Now, interesting thing about the West, uh, about the uh, Blue Ridge and, and the Appalachian mountain ranges that you used to have a lot of like uh, coal mines there, right? And a lot of like open, open, open air pit mines that have giant pits that are not full of water and they're at different levels. So these these particular bits of real estate can now be um, repurposed and leveraged and then converted to these like pump storage plants. And there's quite a lot of them. So there's a lot of opportunity to be able to uh, deploy the system in places that are, that have otherwise been abandoned, right? Uh, so there's there, there's a lot of hope that this could actually have a huge amount of like a, in in the gigawatts of capacity, but also be able to actually uh, create a very very workable, proven, solid energy storage devices that are reliable and that can be used you know, day in and day out. Pretty hopeful on that. Okay, next slide, please. Geothermal, and you do have one in Hawaii, and what that is really is that it's using it's using heat, geothermal heat, to 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 either heat up water or use use some of the heat itself and the steam that's coming out to spin, for example, those uh, steam turbines. Now, these applications generally have um, also a lot of other uh, district heating systems that they that that they're applied for to heat, for example, different homes in an area. But then again, these geothermal plants are also a useful resource to generate electricity. And I know of a few that are in the Hawaiian Islands. Quite a lot of them as well in Iceland and Greenland and all parts of Northern Europe. So this is a very efficient system. It's just susceptible to a lot of you know um, geological problems, right? Whether you have a seismic issue or something like that. But other than that, it's definitely a very very efficient and clean renewable resource. And the last slide: wind turbines. Uh, <clears throat> these were so somehow things have slowed down a little bit, but I, I'm seeing a lot of off offshore wind being installed, which is probably the most efficient way to actually deploy these these resources. But as you can see here, there's quite a lot of mechanisms that are that are that, that are in place in these nacelles, the right? Whether it's like you're changing the pitch of the blade, you can feather them, you can change the angle depending on the wind speed that's happening. If the wind speed is too high, that you tend to just feather them and not and not really uh, spin as much because you you run the risk of damaging the blade or or, or the actual mast, right? Or actually falling over, destroying it. But if you look, you know, there's quite a bit of systems in there. Usually, it's like a, a reduction gear, or actually, it's it's a uh, it's a it's an in, increasing gear where the blade spins a certain speed, but that by gearing makes the generator spin a lot faster, and then it produces power. But then it it is produced back to DC, and then at that point from DC it goes back to AC through an inverter. It's really interesting how that works. But again, these things, even though they're spinning, they do not provide system inertia. 
So always thing to keep always thing to keep in mind. And then of course like anything else, these things all have like a limited useful life. It means about 15, 20 years, maybe less than that. In some cases they need to be like dismantled and usually end up in the landfill. But uh for the most part, they're they're pretty popular in the offshore wind, usually at sea level. All right, so I think that is all we have for today. Uh, hopefully we'll have another installment pretty soon. And uh, but thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to uh, put them in the comments below. I'll try and get back to you and answer. So thank you again and have a great afternoon. Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.